I'm Ken Bowman. I'm a professor of atmospheric sciences at Texas A&M, and I'm the principal investigator for this project, which is called DCOTS, which is short for Dynamics and Chemistry of the Summer Stratosphere. So uh, we're here in Salina, Kansas, with uh, NASA ER-2 high-altitude aircraft behind us. It's uh, carrying a dozen different instruments, and we're here to measure outflow from intense thunderstorms in the stratosphere. So most thunderstorms live down in the troposphere, uh, but the really intense ones actually overshoot into the stratosphere. Now, the stratosphere is normally very dry and cold, and it has a lot of ozone in it. So the stratosphere contains the ozone layer which protects the Earth's surface from solar ultraviolet radiation. So these storms can carry water and pollution from down in the lower atmosphere up into the stratosphere very quickly. And some of that gets mixed out into the stratospheric air, and that's what we're here to measure with the airplane. So the way we go about doing this is we, uh, we monitor the weather radars and um, satellite images of storms so that we can identify where these overshooting storms are happening. And then we calculate where we think the air from the tops of those storms is going to go in the stratosphere. And then we design a, a flight track for the airplane that will carry it through that air so we can measure all of the chemicals that are coming out of the storm into the stratospheric air. How did you, I guess a big question would be, how did you get, um, it, I mean, you're the PI, the principal investigator of something like this. How did you become a principal investigator of a project this large? So projects like this, uh, require a big proposal uh, to NASA and we have a big team working on this project. So there are eight different universities, four NASA centers, uh, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration lab is involved and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So uh, putting a proposal together like that takes a, a big team, it's a big effort and a complicated project like this includes chemists and meteorologists and satellite meteorologists and uh, a really wide variety of expertise. So it, it's a lot of work to put the proposal together and they're, they're very competitive and we were very fortunate to get selected to do this project. Now there's, uh, we've seen a lot, uh, a lot of the different scientists in the group and the, the equipment that they're putting on this plane, which is so impressive, so neat. How did, how is it chosen that like research is like Dan said so with the, the particle stuff how how is that chosen to be a part of the project so we we pick the instruments that are most important for answering the scientific questions that we wanted to answer so uh, we're measuring a really huge variety of different things uh, with that that's why we have so many instruments on the airplane some of them are very long-lived chemicals uh, you know of course we measure water and ozone, um, at carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and methane. Um, we also measure uh, short-lived species, things that don't last very long, uh, like um, formaldehyde, for example, which comes from the troposphere up into the stratosphere. And uh, some instruments um, actually collect air samples, which are brought down to the lab and run through very sensitive mass spectrometers, and they can measure 50 different chemicals in, in those uh, samples. So um, the, the, the instruments were selected to provide the things that we thought were essential to address the questions we're looking at about how much of uh, this air from the troposphere gets into the stratosphere in these storms? Will it contain the chemicals that can actually cause changes in stratospheric chemistry um, and potentially ozone depletion? Um, we, we look closely at water vapor because water vapor is a greenhouse gas and water vapor in the stratosphere can contribute to global warming. So th that's how the uh, instrument team was put together. Uh, we also have a big group of meteorologists to do the, the forecasting, um, to be looking ahead several days so we know whether, when and whether we're going to fly and, and where we think we might fly, and then working out all of the details about where we want the airplane to go. 
Now, um, as a question, a little bit of ignorance for my part. Um, you're talking about ozone. I know you're doing particles and, and all these different chemicals in it. And what is the bigger science, when we're done, what are we wanting to contribute to scientific understanding when we're finally done? When you're done with this mission, you're like, wow, that was so successful and we, because we learned what? So when we're done, what we really hope to know is, uh, if I narrow it down to just a few of the critical questions, so one of them would be, how much water do these storms put into the stratosphere? That's a big question because that affects both chemistry and climate in the stratosphere. Um, do we see evidence of ozone depletion? Uh, do we see chlorine monoxide and uh, other species like that? Um, and and what, what's the role of particles in all of this? Because they play a big role in atmospheric chemistry. So if we can understand how the atmosphere is working now, that will really give us a big step towards trying to predict how the stratosphere might change in the future as the climate changes. That's the big unknown. So this, uh, this project, in addition to looking for uh, a few key questions like that, is also providing this baseline so that as we go forward over the next few decades and the climate warms up, storms may get more intense, the stratosphere may get colder, many things will change. And with this, we'll have a much better idea of what the environment there looks like now so that we'll be better able to model and predict how it can change in the future. Tell us, just, just a short clip about, we're here at the ground level, uh -huh. what's between us and space? Okay. <laughs> she doesn't ask the small questions. No, you, <laughs> we, go, we go right into the, the whole story. I so. ask the random thing. Yeah. She's like, tell me this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you the, the whole story because okay. we'd be here for half an hour. Right? <laughs> so okay. uh, meteorologists divide the atmosphere into four layers, but we're only going to talk about the lower two layers. So the troposphere and the stratosphere. So if you, uh, if you look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere from the ground as you go up, what you normally see in the troposphere, in the lower part of the atmosphere, is that the temperature decreases the higher you go. Right? So when this uh, aircraft is flying, there are places where um, it's, uh, it, it, the temperatures can be as much as minus 70 degrees Celsius. So very cold when you get near the top of the troposphere, the lower layer. And that's the, where the tops of these storms typically are. So all of the clouds that you see up high there are all ice. So when you look at a thunderstorm and you see that big anvil cloud spreading out, that anvil is all ice clouds. It's all cirrus clouds. Now, when you cross over into the stratosphere, we see big changes in the properties in the atmosphere. So the water vapor goes way down and the ozone goes way up. And as you move higher into the stratosphere, the temperature starts to warm up again. And the reason it warms up is because ozone absorbs solar radiation. So it's heating the stratosphere up very high above the surface. And in between is this very cold layer near the top of the troposphere and the bottom of the stratosphere. So that's the region that we're um, we're really flying in with this airplane. This is what it's designed to do. So this airplane can fly as high as 70,000 feet. Wow. Yeah, which is about twice as high as a typical airliner flies. All right, so fact or fiction? Yeah, you ready? Okay. <laughs> He's like, oh, bro. I told you I was a random guy. <laughs> um, I've been told that as you go up to the atmosphere, it gets hotter, but you would freeze to death, even though it's super hot because they said the air molecules was so far apart you would still freeze to death? Is you would this true or fake? You would have to get really, really high for that. Okay. But it's so uh, in the very top of the atmosphere, what we call the thermosphere, okay. which is right on the very edge of space, much higher than this airplane can go. Um, temperatures actually get very hot there, but the air density is extremely low, many orders of magnitude lower than it is down here at the ground. So yes, it would be actually be very cold, even though the, those molecules are moving very fast, there aren't very many of them.